And over the next several days, we are going to be talking about five different chemical cycles that take place in our ecosystems to provide uh, the nutrients and the gases that are necessary for life. So as we go through these different chemical cycles, um, you're gonna see that there are basically three basic steps to each one. The chemical or the substance that we are talking about um, has a place in the abiotic environment or in the place where, there, where nothing is living. Um, then it gets transferred from the abiotic environment to the producers and then it gets transferred to consumers because remember consumers eat producers. The producers and the consumers are then going to produce waste, they're going to die, they're going to decay, and then at that point, those um, same chemicals are gonna get transferred back into the abiotic environment again. So this same cycle is gonna happen over and over and over again in all five of the cycles that we're going to discuss. Now, to try to help you keep straight in each of these cycles, which area is which, we're going to be using a color coding system, which is why I told you uh, in the instructions for today that you needed to have a red, a blue, and a green colored pencil. So here's the, the color code that we're going to be using over the next couple of days. Anything that we code in red is going to be coming out of the abiotic environment. So basically, it, this is going to be right here. So if it's coming from the abiotic environment and going into the producers or coming to the place where the producers can get a hold of it, we're going to color code that red. Okay. If it's green, it's going to be within the biotic environment. So then what's going to be happening here is when it goes from the producers to the consumers and then when it goes into uh, waste and decay, anything within that biotic environment is going to be colored green. And then when it goes from um, the biotic environment back to the abiotic environment, so here from waste and decay back to the abiotic environment, we are going to color that blue, all right? So um, that's, those are the colors that we're going to be using in the certain, certain areas of the cycle, and we're gonna be consistent with that all the way through all five of the cycles that we're gonna be talking about so that hopefully it will make a little bit more sense to you, okay? We're gonna start with the water cycle, and um, this one is a tad bit different um, just because we, we're not really going to see that in the producers and consumers so much, but I did still color code it with three, um, specific, the three, three specific colors so that it's basically in the sky or it's down on the earth. And that's how I have defined um, these two places so that we can use, still use the same color coding scheme. Now again, the, the water cycle is probably something that you studied in elementary school, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but we are going to review it again, uh, just so you um, have it fresh in your mind. Um, the, make sure that you have the diagrams for the water cycle and the carbon cycle that I directed you to have. If you don't have them, you need to stop the video and go find them, uh, because you are gonna to need to mark these as we're going through. So on your diagram of the water cycle, um, you will see at the top of the page that there are several places where precipitation is occurring. So precipitation is going to be anything from rain and snow and sleet and hail. All of those types of things are considered precipitation. So if you look at the top of the page, you will see two arrows marked precipitation and you need to take your red colored pencil and you need to color those red to match the red color that I have the word precipitation written in. Um, if at some point I am going a little bit too fast and you can't color that fast, just reach up and hit pause on the video so that you can um, color everything in as we're going over it. Okay, then the next step is going to be where that precipitation ends up. Precipitation is going to end up in the ocean. A lot of it's going to end up in the ocean because three-fourths of our earth is covered with water or it's going to end up on the ground. And then once it hits the ground, you've got a couple of different options. Um, it can um, flow into a creek, which will flow into a river, which will uh, then flow back into the ocean again at some point. 
uh, or it may soak into the ground and then it's going to soak down into um, the groundwater, which is where if you have a well, that's where your well water comes from. It can soak e uh, down even deeper than that into some of your aquifers. And then eventually a lot of that water, even the groundwater can flow back into the ocean again. Okay, so any of those arrows that you see there and on your sheet, um, you're gonna see basically two arrows, three arrows that talk about a river outlet and they talk about groundwater flow that's gonna go into the ocean. Those are arrows that you want to cover to color green. Uh, I'll show you the, the finished diagram here in just a minute once I get through going over it. Okay, then once you've got um, your, your groundwater uh, that has acted as stream runoff. Um, once it's gone in, down into the aquifer, some of that has gone back out into the ocean again. Then you've got to get it back into the abiotic environment. And so there's two different ways that that can happen. One is evaporation. And you guys have all seen evaporation take place. If you have a rainstorm, then you have a puddle left over, and then eventually that puddle disappears. Well, what happened to the water? Um, well, it evaporated off into the air and turned into water vapor. Uh, the other thing that can happen is transpiration. And transpiration is what happens when the plants um, take water in through their roots. Remember, that's the precipitation that's gone down into the ground. And then the roots will absorb that water and they will send it up the tree uh, through the processes that we talked about, how water molecules cling to one another. We talked about that uh, in the last chapter. And so it, the water is drawn up through the tree or up through any kind of plant. It gets up to the leaves where the leaves are going to be using that water to perform photosynthesis. And then um, they actually expel uh, water vapor through their leaves and then that water vapor goes back into the air. So transpiration includes evaporation in it, but transpiration specifically is happening with plants. Okay, so... Um, You've got all of your water vapor going back into the air, either through a method of evaporation or transpiration. And you should see two arrows on your diagram, one for evaporation, um, which is gonna happen just from any standing water or from any um, flowing water for that matter too. A lot of evaporation is gonna happen from the ocean and it's also gonna happen from transpiration. So your finished diagram, when you have all your arrows colored in, should look like this. So you can see the two red arrows for the precipitation. You can see the green arrows down there for the stream flow. And then you can see the blue arrows for the transpiration and the evaporation. Okay. Again, that's the water cycle. And it's probably not anything new. You've probably talked about that when you were in, I can imagine you probably talked about it even in fourth or fifth grade. And when you talked about the water cycle. Now, the other cycle that we're going to talk about today, uh, we call it the carbon cycle, but we actually track carbon via carbon dioxide. And so if you recall, uh, the formula for carbon dioxide is CO2. So it's got one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen uh, to make up this carbon dioxide. And um, carbon dioxide actually is going to come out of the air. Now you need to get your other diagram for the, for the carbon cycle here. Carbon dioxide is going to come out of the air in two specific ways. Um, the first is by photosynthesis. And this is um, by far the biggest um, user of, of carbon dioxide is photosynthesis. Now plants perform photosynthesis again to make food uh, for themselves and then when we when we eat the plants or when we eat something that the plants have produced fruits or vegetables um, we're having food for ourselves as well so they require carbon dioxide to perform this photosynthesis um, be aware that a lot of photosynthesis also happens in the ocean there are a lot of plants there are um, there's algae there's diatoms that live in the ocean and they all perform photosynthesis and so they are going to use the carbon dioxide from the air to perform this photosynthesis. The other thing that can happen is that the carbon dioxide in the air can be dissolved into the oceans. And so that's um, another way that it's going to come out of the abiotic environment and go down into the biotic environment. There are a lot of living things in the oceans, okay? So you should find um, two arrows on your diagram 
Um, one is arrow B, and the other is arrow P. So arrow B is the one for photosynthesis, and arrow P is the one for where it is dissolving into the ocean. So those two arrows you want to color red. All right, now, um, once the photosynthesis has happened, once it's in the ocean, now our, our, um, our producers um, are going to be able to transfer that to the consumers. And so there's also a number of different things that are going to be happening here for that to happen. So if you look at um, arrow E and arrow F, those both represent consumption. And when I say consumption, what I'm talking about is something is eating something else. So arrow E is showing you that the, the deer is eating the plants. And then if you look at arrow F, you can see that the, um, I don't know if that's a cougar or whatever he is there, he is going to be eating the deer. And so both of those are types of consumption. So the carbon dioxide that has been um, in, incorporated into the plant is now going to be going into the consumers, into the animals, and with arrows E and F, okay? Then there are two arrows that actually have a label H on them, and that is the decay. And so we talked up here about decay. We said producers and consumers are, they're both gonna have, consumers are gonna have waste, producers and consumers are both gonna die, and so there's gonna be um, decay involved in, in the bodies that are going to decay, and the decay when you've got your decomposers that are causing that decay to happen uh, that process is going to put carbon dioxide back into the air as well now sometimes what happens is that some of that um, decay some of that waste um, ends up turning into um, fossil fuels so if you see um, arrow k you can see that some of that is turned into fossil fuels and then um, arrow M is where we take the fossil fuels and we're using them in one way or another. Um, so all of those arrows are going to be colored green. Then to get the carbon dioxide back into the um, abiotic environment, again, there's about three different ways that can happen. Uh, the first way is through respiration. And uh, respiration is uh, label... D and label G and also kind of label J. Um, label D is where the respiration of the plants, label G is the respiration of the animals, and then level uh, arrow J is the respiration of the um, de uh, decomposers, <laughs> there's the word, the decomposers that are actually decomposing that decay. So when I say respiration, you are probably thinking of breathing because uh, respiration is the word that we commonly use for breathing, but in biology, the term respiration is actually a much larger term, and it encompasses any time a cell uses energy. And in a couple modules from now, we're going to talk a great deal about the process of respiration. And so just be aware that this is not just breathing, it is any time a cell takes energy and or takes food and breaks it down into energy that's what is considered respiration so if you take food and break it down into energy that's respiration and so that's what i'm talking about when i talk about the respiration of plants because uh, we know plants don't really breathe uh, but the respiration of plants and the respiration of animals includes any type of, of breakdown of the, that they're using in their cells of food to turn it into energy um, decay also uh, you can really put letter J both places there uh, for that particular process. And then when you take the fossil fuels and you burn them, which is letter N, that's combustion, and that puts carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere as well. So um, all of those arrows should be colored blue. So therefore, your finished diagram of the carbon cycle is gonna look like this. You can see um, a number of different um, green arrows and blue arrows, because some of them are marked in, in two different places. So um, you can check your work there and make sure that you have the right arrows colored with the correct colors, okay? Um, in a couple of days, we will pick up the other three cycles as well as the greenhouse effect.